Um, the title of my talk today is Big and Small, They Mind Them All, Thinking About Scale and Mining History. And I've got to say that this is really uh, provoked. Um, my thoughts have really been, been occupied lately by this idea of scale, um, especially in mining history, not exclusively so. Um, and so, uh, so what does that even mean? Okay, well, for one thing, uh, it really doesn't mean this. Uh, we've got the check weighman here, uh, you know, loading, uh, uh, making sure that the the, uh, the miner gets appropriate credit for uh, for his coal in Harlan County. Uh, check weighmen, of course, were a major issue in some of those union actions um, because uh, they were the only backstop of the union to make sure that the company was paying the, the miners fairly. So, I mean, this is scale in mining history, but that's not really what I mean. Um, and I also don't mean this, although, uh, of, of course, uh, scales on mind maps. Most people know that I've got a, a real keen uh, interest in, in those kinds of things. Uh, no, but for me, the, this question about scale is a little bit bigger than that. You know, it's like one, you get one of those those concepts, sort of a big concept kind of stuck in your brain, like a catchy tune or something like that. You know, concepts like this are hard to pin down. They're hard to articulate. Um, and at least if your, your brain works like mine does, uh, they're impossible to ignore. And so this is what the idea of of scale has been for me uh, for quite some time. And, and so it turns out that scale is one of those concepts that can help you gain new insights, I think, uh, by seeing things in greater or lesser detail, right? You can zoom in, you can zoom out. Um, you know, scale can also make things difficult to comprehend, uh, maybe even impossible. Human minds struggle to deal with scales that are vastly different uh, than our own. Uh, I'm reminded here of a, a moment in the humorous science fiction book series, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I don't know if any of you are Hitchhiker's Guide uh, fans, uh, which describes the most infernal torture machine in existence. It's the total perspective vortex. Um, and, uh, quote, when you are put into the vortex, you are given just one momentary glimpse of the entire unimaginable infinity of creation. And somewhere in it, a tiny little marker, a microscopic dot on a microscopic dot that says, you are here, unquote. Uh, that's the kind of torture that sometimes scale uh, brings to us. It's just too big for the human mind to comprehend. So today I'd like to take a crack at talking about scale in mining history by examining Nevada, uh, our putative uh, meeting location, and it also happens to be my home state. Uh, while the details are specific to this place, as every mining history should be, um, I think there are some broader patterns that are widely applicable to other mining spaces, mind spaces, um, and then others still that might be truly distinctive or perhaps even unique in, in Nevada's case. Um, so, uh, so let me start by saying what is uh, both staggeringly important and probably old news to some or maybe most of you. Uh, we are currently living in the time of a Western gold rush, and it's happening in Nevada. It's it's just that simple. This rush is not the sort that prompted frenzied gold seekers to pack their belongings and head for California. And the chances of anyone finding a fortune laying on the ground are almost nil today. Uh, but instead, today's modern gold rush is based on sophisticated geology, uh, elephantine earth moving machinery, and gold so finely disseminated that it could not be detected by a traditional prospector's pan. The deposits, however, are sufficiently vast, uh -huh, scale again, uh, so as to make this quote unquote rush, uh, last a lifetime or more. Uh, the historic heart of this gold rush, so revolutionary that its name has become a byword for similar deposits found elsewhere is the Carlin trend. Uh, so let's start with thinking about scale then in this context, and perhaps you'll appreciate why this has been bugging me. There are really four scales, four scales I think, that make modern Nevada gold mining both impressive and so challenging to discuss with appropriate perspective. Uh, so one scale, is microscopic or itty bitty, uh, micron gold. It's invisible to earlier prospectors. This is what's sought by modern miners. Um, by the way, geologists, you need to get on the posting of pictures of ore samples that are uh, that are available in the public domain. I had to, to pick this one up. This is Twin Creeks, which is near Getchell. So it's Carlin type, but it's not actually Carlin. Uh, come on, you're picture people. More pictures of rocks. Anyway, not pretty rocks. There are lots of pictures of pretty rocks. Uh, but we've got this scale, right? This is scale number one. This is microscopic kind of scale. This is one of the reasons why the Carlin gold trend is so difficult to comprehend. Uh, the, the other thing is that the vastness of the output, uh, that's a, a scale that is also difficult to comprehend, not because it's small, but because it's large. Uh, the third scale is the length of time that this activity has been carried out on a high level. 
um, both of which you can see from this graph, right? You can see uh, the Carlin mine comes online right about here, 1965. Uh, this, is, this graph represents the whole sweep of American mining history, essentially, uh, from uh, before the gold rush in California uh, to more or less the present day. Um, and uh, this last part uh, of the graph, the great big piece, um, is the time of the Nevada gold rush and the, the dark orange here itself specifically is Nevada's contribution to it. Uh, you know, long time period, vast scales, vast output. Um, and then the most challenging scale to articulate, I think, is the fourth, uh, which is really about determining the Carlin trend's place in historical perspective. We can't fit that on this graph. So in my talk today, I'll talk a little bit about accomplishments in these first three scales, uh, but my real target is the fourth one, that sense of historical perspective. Uh, to try to get some purchase on this, I'll provide an overview of the history and demography of mining on the Carlin trend and situate it in comparative historical perspective with other Western mining activity. Okay, so, uh, so some of this is uh, undoubtedly old news uh, to, to you, some of what's, what's next to come, but I wanna make sure that we uh, lay that historical foundation so we're all on the same page here. Um, you know, if we talk about Western mining from the 1840s to today, um, you know, I think it's convenient to think of it as several distinct but overlapping waves. Um, each wave saw different minerals, different types of deposits, different levels of techno-scientific skill, and ever-changing economic and labor markets. The first wave was the placer mining for gold in California, uh, then elsewhere in the West, uh, as we heard, for example, from uh, some of our speakers today, that iconic gold rush 49er with his pan, as you can see here. Placer mining ranged in complexity from pans and rockers, pretty simple, long tom sluices, reaching peaks of scale with hydraulic mining in the 1880s and 1890s, and technological practice with gold dredging in the first three decades of the 20th century. Placer miners were almost always in search of gold, uh, and the surface deposits they sought were relatively easy to work. Communities supported by placer mines tended to be as short-lived as their deposits. Now in the second wave, uh, beginning in the 1850s, um, drawing on Spanish, Mexican, and English practices, Western miners shifted to hard rock ores, where the minerals of interest needed some combination of crushing, chemistry, and heat to separate them from waste rock. Hard rock miners sought gold and silver, uh, and sometimes other valuable minerals, uh, metals, such as mercury and copper, by following veins underground to high-grade ore bodies. This type of mining was technology intensive, requiring a complicated infrastructure of hoisting haulage and stoping to keep workers alive underground and facilitate work. It was selective as skilled miners attempted to exercise their judgment in order to extract the ores and leave as much non-mineralized rock in place as possible. And it was labor intensive due to the slow pace at which teams of miners could drill, break, haul, and load, uh, load and haul uh, rock underground. From Grass Valley to the Comstock Load to Leadville to Butte, uh, selective underground mining techniques could achieve tremendous production rates on rich ores containing a variety of minerals, uh, provided that sufficient technology, capital, expertise, and labor were available. Hard rock mining communities, like placer-oriented ones, tended toward impermanence, but some of the largest and deepest mines could, due to the extensiveness of their deposits, support essentially permanent communities. I'm thinking, of course, of Butte and Leadville and Virginia City. Um, third phase. After the turn of the 20th century, uh, a third wave of distinctive mining practice drew from mass production techniques to exploit larger deposits with much lower average grades of mineralization. Uh, these were epitomized, although not entirely, you know, there's more to it than this, but they were epitomized, I think, by the porphyry coppers, uh, in which the mineral content was spread through so-called porphyry rock uh, rather than concentrated in veins like earlier mining. Uh, porphyry copper mines, such as those at Bingham Canyon, Utah, which you see here in the 1940s, um, Miami and Arizona, Ely, Nevada, and Chino, uh, New Mexico uh, used math, mass production methods such as open pits or underground block caving uh, to mine far larger quantities of ore per employee. The relative lack of selectivity at the mine was corrected at the mill, where advancements in crushing technology and mineral separation helped these mass production mines gr collect greater percentages of metal from ever lower grades of ore. Uh, porphyry copper mines commonly supported stable, if small, communities due in part to the extended life of these types of mines, uh, as the extensive technological requirements and low grades meant that a mine usually wasn't worth opening unless it was a truly vast deposit mineable for decades. Um, by 1960, 
an initial period of development in the 19-teens and 1920s, and a second period of expansion in the 1950s meant that the most important Western mining, if judged on the basis of value and employment, was copper mining, uh, often but not always in an open pit. Uh, this third wave also saw a shift away from mining gold to mining copper and base metals. Uh, gold mined in the West had had a fixed value of $20.67 per ounce until 1934, uh, and a fixed value of $35 per ounce from 1934 to 1971. The mining of gold, except for as a byproduct of copper mines, uh, was also suspended by executive order during World War II as a conservation measure. As a consequence, the combination of low gold price and the momentum stopper of World War II meant that little mining for gold was being done in the United States by the 1950s and 60s. Uh, by the mid-1970s, however, the U.S. left the gold standard and the price of gold was allowed to float, which was an important factor that ultimately helped drive investment in Carlin-type mines. When it opened in 1965, the Carlin trend brought together many of the mass production techniques first developed for porphyry copper mining and applied them to mining gold. Combined with innovative geological thinking, this was sufficient to begin the Carlin trend rush, though Carlin -style mining, the Carlin-style mining wave uh, benefited tremendously from further mining and metallurgical developments, along with a substantially higher price of gold once the US left the gold standard. Okay, so let me pause for a second and uh, for an important note about language uh, and, note, and acknowledge the difficulty. Uh, I, again, I think this is a difficulty prompted by scale uh, in using language consistently. There's the Carlin mine itself, uh, about which more in a moment. Uh, then there's a large but distinct geological formation, which we might call a load in the 20th century, uh, of which the Carlin mine is a part. That's the Carlin trend. Uh, then there are mines that are operated in similar ways, which is to say that they chase after microscopic gold, often in deposits that are similar to those <laughs> on the Carlin trend. Depending on the similarity, these are Carlin type mines, which geologists use to talk about the rock, and others seem to use to talk about the scale and the type of technology employed. These are all shifting targets, of course, and Geologists and engineers figure out new tools and techniques to extract gold, uh, and the great majority of these mines are located in Nevada, uh, but mostly but not entirely in the northeastern uh, part of the state. You know, I think uh, as I was trying to prepare this talk, I think about A.B. Parsons. He did mining historians an enormous favor by synthesizing major changes in the copper industry under the heading of the porphyry coppers. Um, we don't have a, a comparably broad linguistic umbrella to talk about these in the modern Nevada gold mines. So mostly I will say Carlin type here to describe these modern Nevada mines, and I'll try to save the Carlin trend uh, to mean more specifically those in northeastern Nevada uh, on or near the, the Carlin trend itself, although I know that some, in some cases I, I fail at that because of the nature of this data. Uh, people who know this area much better than I do will notice that sometimes this lumps things together that are slightly different. Um, such as the Cortez trend and the Carlin trend, for example. Uh, but since my goal is historical synthesis and really thinking about scale, uh, I hope I'll be forgiven uh, for this. Similarly, there are Carlin type mines located outside the borders of Nevada, but those aren't my focus today. Um, so with that in mind, uh, let's discuss the Carlin trend. It's a belt of, of mineralization in north central Nevada where gold is found in sedimentary rather than igneous rocks and microscopic particles invisible to prospectors of an earlier generation. The trend itself is uh, located near the borders between Eureka County and Elko County, about which more in a moment, uh, is, is here. This is the Carlin trend, basically. Um, I don't know if you'd include that or not, but certainly it's, it's this part. This is the heart of the Carlin trend right here. Um, and then, so this is an example. This is the, the Cortez trend, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the trend itself uh, is about five miles wide and about 40 miles long. It's unfathomably large compared to mineral districts of an earlier age. Uh, additionally, gold deposits of similar geological structure have been found elsewhere in, in Nevada, such as those along the Battle Mountain Eureka or Cortez trend. As I mentioned a moment ago, technically these are Carlin type deposits, uh, you know, but to investors promoting gold stocks and to the general public, they often get lumped together with the Carlin trend itself. Discovery of this gold bearing Carlin trend is generally credited to geologists John Livermore and J. Allen Coop of Newmont Mining Company with a key geological assist by Ralph Roberts of the U.S. Geological Survey. I understand there's some debate about the particulars of this. I'm sure Dean Height can fill us in uh, more. See, this is, in a normal conference, I would have had a beer with Dean last night, taken some notes and revised my talk, but now I can't do that. So sorry, Dean, you're, you're going you're gonna to have to tell me all this stuff later. Tell me how I'm wrong. Um, but as Livermore constantly acknowledged, uh, microscopic gold uh, deposits were found 
uh, in previous decades as well. The Getchell Mine, the Standard, the Gold Acres, they all operated in the 1930s in northern Nevada. Uh, and though there were differences between them and between those in the later Carlin Trend mines, each mined gold that could only be detected by means of a fire assay rather than a quick look at with the prospector's uh, sampling pan. Uh, Livermore visited Getchell in 1940. Uh, later, he worked briefly at the Standard in 1948. And after reviewing a 1939 report by O.W. Vandenberg on these unusual mines, he came away, with, came away with the nagging thought that there must be other ore bodies with microscopic disseminated gold lurking in Nevada. In 1960, USGS uh, geologist Roberts described a major zone of tectonic movement he called the Roberts Thrust, after the Roberts Mountain where it was first noticed, uh, not after himself. Uh, Livermore took note, um, and he proposed to Newmont, his employer, uh, to explore along this zone. Livermore got the okay, and then in 1961, he took to the field uh, along with a, another young Newmont geologist, J. Allen Coop. Um, and this was an unusual move. Uh, conventional wisdom in the mining industry at the time suggested that gold deposits near enough to the surface to mine with an open pit probably didn't exist. Um, and with gold at $35 an ounce, you know, mass production mining underground could not make low grades of ore payable. Uh, as of about 1960, what little gold production there was in the lower 48 uh, consisted of the famous Homestake Mine in South Dakota, sitting on a world-class, deep-level deposit, uh, several helpings of marginal operators scratching at small veins or plaster deposits, uh, and gold produced as a byproduct of copper mining. That's as, as of 1960. Uh, the two geologists sampled themselves up and down the Roberts Thrust uh, gradually refining their picture of the geology and eventually zeroed in on an area about 20 miles north of the railroad town uh, of Carlin, Nevada, just inside the border with Eureka County. Uh, here's, uh, I'll skip ahead just a little bit. This, uh, these dashed lines, I hope you can see, those are the county boundaries. So this tall, narrow one right here, this is Eureka County. Um, this sort of large, overbearing one over here is Elko County, not all of Elko County, mind you. Um, here we have uh, the series of dots represents today the Carlin trend. Um, and the Carlin mine itself is right about there. So inside Eureka County. Um, and you might say, well, where's Carlin? Uh, Carlin is this blue dot right there on I-80, which is also by the railroad there. Carlin was a railroad town. Carlin is just inside Elko County. Um, and then Elko, the town itself, is over here, uh, also along the railroad and subsequently Interstate 80. Uh, so we've got Elko here, we've got Carlin here, we've got Elko County sort of right here, and the Carlin trend cutting off the top of Eureka County, the original Carlin mine being in Eureka County. Um, so uh, so they thought that this seemed pretty good. You know, they, uh, they sampled their way to a place called Popovich Hill. Um, the sample values held sufficient promise to justify staking some claims. Uh, once the claims were secured, they dug several trenches with a bulldozer, uh, they found even better values underneath the surface. Uh, Newmont personnel returned in spring of 1962 to further develop their information through a drilling campaign, further exploration. Uh, what they found confirmed and boosted the values that they'd uncovered earlier, and Newmont moved forward to acquire the land, build a mill, bring the mine into production. And, and the first gold bar was poured in the mill in May of, eight, of 1965, May of 1965. Uh, so right from the beginning, the Carlin was a large mine despite its, its low-grade ore. Uh, with opening reserves of 11 million tons at 0.32 ounces of gold per ton. The total cost of the project up to the point of production was $10 million, a very modest figure by later standards. Uh, but the mining cost of such ore was only $4 or $5 per ton because it was located right at the surface. Um, and the metallurgical treatment using cyanide to extract the gold was also inexpensive. So Carlin made money right from the start, even with, the, uh, with gold at the low fixed price of $35 per ton. Uh, per ounce, <laughs> not $35 per, ton, per ounce. Um, okay, so uh, let me back up one slide here. Um, yeah, we got a clear boom, don't we? Uh, this one, of course, the 1960s is would be off the scale in the very tiny values uh, over here to the left. Um, and I think the, the rush to the, to the Carlin trend should probably be considered a little bit more of a mosey. Um, because it was nearly two decades of production before the kind of frenzied activity commonly associated with a gold rush might be observed. Uh, the Carlin mine came into production in 1965, having started more or less, you would say, in 1961 or 62. Uh, before the decade was over, Placer Dome, a Canadian company, explored and brought into production a similar, though initially smaller, disseminated gold deposit at Cortez, Nevada, some 75 miles from the Carlin mine. 
Uh, that was producing gold by December 1968. Uh, Cortez was technically located on a parallel trend, not the Carlin trend, uh, but it was a Carlin type mine in the sense that it was an open pit, mass production gold mine, chasing low grade ore found in sedimentary rocks and treating those ores with cyanide to recover the metal. Uh, Cortez was co important to the history of the Carlin trend for a second reason. That mine, Cortez, uh, was the first to use cyanide heat leaching in production, a cornerstone technology of Carlin style mass production mining to follow. At first, Cortez had a traditional cyanide mill, as did the Carlin mine. Uh, the, the idea of stacking ore onto a pile and wetting it with water cyanide solution to extract the gold cost effectively originated with the US Bureau of Mines Research Laboratory in Salt Lake City. Working closely with the Bureau, engineers at Cortez ran a large pilot scale tests uh, in 1969. And when those proved satisfactory, uh, they integrated heap leaching into their operation at full scale by 1970. Uh, once the heap was in operation, the higher grades of ore were sent to the mill, while the lower grades were sent to the heap. A distinct advantage for Cortez in making this technological shift was that once the cyanide solution carried gold dissolved from the heap, the pregnant solution, that, that is to say it has gold in it, uh, could simply be sent to the mill and processed with the technology that was already in place. Uh, of particular note is the fact that the initial Cortez heap leaching system used run-of-mine ore, uh, just as it came from the mine without additional crushing. Uh, this reduced recovery rate to 60 or 70 percent, but it eliminated the cost of additional crushing. Uh, of course, today, uh, if you've got a mine that, that is designed around heap leaching, uh, you know, the, it's very common to finally crush the ore before stacking it on the heap so that you get maximum uh, exposure to the cyanide and thus uh, maximum extraction. Uh, so despite the success at Carlin and for Placer Dome at Cortez, uh, expansion proceeded modestly. Uh, exploration and acquisition of property by Newmont took place mostly in the immediate vicinity of the two existing mines and was the responsibility of the operating staff of the mine, which meant that in practice, exploration received less emphasis. Newmont's corporate headquarters staff also paid relatively little attention to Carlin compared with its other mines. In 1974, nine years after mining began at Carlin, Newmont started operations at Blue Star and Bootstrap, just up the road from the original mine, and operations at Maggie Creek, closer to the town of Carlin, uh, along the same trend line, opened in 1980. Each of these operations was close enough to send ore to the Carlin mill. Newmont began using heap leaching for lower grades near the mines uh, themselves in 1979. Um, so it took them almost a decade to adopt that from, from their neighbor, neighbors at Cortez. So if that's, a, if that's the Mosey, uh, then that Mosey becomes a, a full-fledged rush in the 1980s. And here on this, this slide, you can really see it take off, right? Uh, this is, uh, the bars are the millions of troy ounces, you know, and you get this kind of like higher level starting in 1980, and then boom, starting in 1986, seven, and so on, you get massive increases in production. Um, in 1981, pressured by rumors of corporate takeovers, Newmont put more energy into drilling out improving up reserves such as those at Gold Quarry, uh, adjacent to Maggie Creek, uh, which showed more than 175 million tons of ore. After difficult negotiations secured the private land under which most of the gold was located, an extensive planning program ultimately resulted in construction of a new mine and mill, which opened in 1985. And I think Gold Quarry is still in production. Somebody would probably know better than I do, but they've produced uh, more than uh, 10 million ounces of gold out of that, out of that mine. Um, after the initial successful operations at Carlin and Cortez, uh, smaller mining companies took up holdings in the area. These so-called junior companies in the modern uh, mining corporate parlance sometimes found good deposits, but they generally lacked the capital or expertise to fully develop the mines on their own, and they commonly struggled to make it work before being acquired by other firms. Uh, the most significant was a property called Gold Strike, uh, just northwest of Newmont's Carlin properties. Pan Canna Minerals began small-scale mining uh, on Gold Strike in, uh, in 1976, uh, and in 1978, Western States Mining joined the operation. Uh, Newmont turned down an offer to buy the mine at this point, uh, which they would later regret. Um, through the mid-1980s, Newmont tended to act conservatively. Uh, but in response to a takeover bid uh, in 1987, Newmont became much more aggressive about plans to expand operations along the Carlin trend. Uh, the takeover bid was eventually repelled by Newmont, but the firm took on substantial debt to do so, doubling down uh, on the productivity potential of its Nevada mines. Uh, not the first ones to double down in Nevada, of course. Um, this translated to a, a tremendous new activity on the ground in 1988. Uh, Newmont built three new mills, developed several previously discovered deposits into large new mines, ordered huge quantities of larger equipment. Production of gold tripled, tripled from 1986 to 1989, as you can see on this graph here, uh, surpassing 1.4 million ounces per year. 
The new attention being paid to the Carlin trend in the mid-1980s by Eastern capitalists attracted bigger players to the area's mines. One of those that ultimately proved most important was the purchase of gold strike by American Barrick Resources, a Canadian firm, in early 1987 for the then astounding sum of $65 million. Um, in contrast to Nuance limited enthusiasm, which was framed by the company's interest in near surface ore bodies, uh, Barrick, on the other hand, bet on the deepening of the Carlin trend mineralization and found rich values much deeper than Newmont had looked. Newmont quickly followed suit, of course, and discovered deeper ore bodies on its own properties in late 1987. Underground mining on the Carlin trend, mostly through declines uh, or portals then, rather than traditional shafts, uh, began in 1993 and coexists with open pit style mining today. Uh, some of those declines uh, actually are, interestingly, they, the portal is at the bottom of an existing open pit, which is kind of neat. Okay, uh, so from a geographical perspective, you see a large number of Carlin type mines scattered across Northern Nevada, with most of them having come online no earlier than the mid 1980s. So far, this is where most accounts of the quote unquote history of the Carlin trend stop. Lots of mines, massive productions, uh, corporate histories and so on. I re recognize, of course, I've given short shrift to the geological exploration and technical innovations uh, such as autoclaving and biooxidation that help propel, propel particular companies, particular mines, uh, particular operations at particular times. Uh, but in scaling out, right, zooming back, uh, some of these details must be left out. So that's my choice for the moment here, but I don't want you to think that, that those don't exist and that those aren't important. Um, but I want to push a little farther than the standard account um, and think about what these huge scale operations, uh, scale on this geological, technological, financial basis, actually meant in terms of the lives of individuals. After all, our most compelling works of history about the California gold rush or the Comstock load or, or Leadville are about people, people whose lives are played out on a stage set by the geology and technology, but not the other way around, right? Uh, one way to capture these experiences, of course, is to talk to people. Uh, oral history is an invaluable tool for recording modern mining history. Um, and I wrote something to that effect in the foreword for Lee Swent's excellent new book, One Shot for Gold. Uh, but that's not what I'm doing here. I'm not doing oral history. Uh, I mean, where do you start? <laughs> like, holy cow. Also, I don't live there. You know, I mean, that would be, uh, that's a worthy project, but not something that I've been able to uh, to tackle. There are a few. Uh, Livermore was interviewed uh, by, by Lee, thankfully, but there are a whole bunch of others who haven't been. Um, but instead, I want to try and use statistics to paint a portrait of a modern gold mining community at this broader scale. Okay, so again, just a refresher on the mines and jurisdictions here. Remember, we're looking at Elko, which is the county seat of Elko County. It's the biggest town around here. Um, then you've got Eureka County where a lot, but not all of the mines are, including the Carlin Trend themselves mines. Those are mostly in Eureka County. Eureka County's seat is the town of Eureka, uh, which Dick Reed is gonna tell us about before too long, but that's way down here. Uh, that's Eureka way down there on Highway 50. So in, in most of this, we're talking about Elko and, and Carlin itself, and then the Carlin Trend, okay. So several caveats are, are in order. Uh, there's this Elko County thing, right? The, the distinction between Elko County and Eureka County, where is the mining actually happening? Where, is the people, where are the people living? Second caveat is this pattern of the gold mosey, right? Where uh, Carlin opens up in 1965, but you have relatively small operations, uh, relatively small things until the 1980s. But then that takeoff in the 1980s could happen in different kinds of ways. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not a starter's pistol, everybody rush uh, type of, of rush here. Um, and then the third caveat is uh, simply about the number of workers that were actually employed. I mean, these are technologically intensive mines, but that doesn't mean that they're labor intensive, uh, you know, by the standards of an earlier period. Um, a, a key component in the Carlin mines, low cost of operation was limited workforce, actually, um, as a consequence of being an open pit mine from the beginning. When the mine first opened, this is the Carlin mine, they had one shovel and two large dump trucks. That was all. That was all they needed to move the ore to the mill. Uh, the mill building had been designed to operate with a limited crew. It only needed three workers per shift. Uh, when the mine began to produce gold, the total workforce was barely 100 men. Uh, employment by Newmont stayed in this range for two decades. So again, kind of a mosey, not a rush. Um, from the start of the Carlin mine, most of the workforce preferred to live in Elko, the larger town located about 40 miles uh, from the mine, rather than in Carlin, which was half the distance, uh, but much smaller. Uh, both Carlin and Elko were founded in the 1860s by the Central Pacific Railroad. And while Carlin remained railroad oriented into the late 19th, 20th century, Elko became a county seat and a general services hub with an emphasis on ranching. 
while many Nevada towns in 1960 would have had at least some exposure to small-scale mining activity in their hinterlands, neither Elko nor Carlin were mining towns at the time of the Carlin discoveries, and not for decades later. I think we could make a, have a real good, interesting discussion about whether or not Elko qualifies as a mining town. Um, not long after opening, to address a grievance about the lengthy commute uh, and bad road to the mine, Newmont purchased three buses to carry mine workers from Elko, though some miners still chose to commute on their own or to carpool. And of course, I wrote that a couple of uh, some time ago, but uh, thinking about uh, uh, about Corey Fisher Hoffman's uh, very interesting paper in a very different context, but uh, same idea of, of, of where people live versus where they work. Uh, crucially, while both towns, Carlin and Elko, are located in Elko County, the Carlin mine itself was just over the border in Eureka County, as, as you saw. Okay, so let's look at their population. Uh, this is a uh, rural county population in Nevada. Uh, here, the heavy green line is Elko County, and Eureka County, by contrast, is the heavy orange line. Um, and as we can see in this table, the overall population of these counties, as well as the population uh, uh, potentially employed as miners, remained quite low for decades after the 1965 commencement of production in Carlin. Right here's 1970. Everybody, all these rural counties are fairly, fairly small at that point. I've left off Clark County and Washoe County, which is where uh, Las Vegas and Reno are respectively, because those things, you know, totally mess these these graphs up. Um, and so, uh, so we've got this um, major population jump in Elko County between the 18, 1980 and 1990 censuses. Right, this this part of the graph here. Um, we don't necessarily see that in some of these other counties, such as Eureka. There's a lot of mining going on in Eureka County, but you're not seeing the population there. Um, the, uh, the, the other part that we see here is that Elko County is not the only place that's growing. Nevada in general was growing tremendously at this time. Um, and a number of these rural counties uh, had nothing to do with mining yet. They were growing extensively. This is Carson City here, of course, uh, we've got Douglas County here, which is my home uh, county. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Lyon and uh, right here, I think. And then uh, Nye is is this one here. So those ones, except for Elko, are, are basically not being driven by mining growth. They're being driven by growth to proximity of the major cities. Uh, Carson, Lyon, Douglas are all sort of in that northeastern, uh, northwestern Nevada corridor. Um, somewhat close to Reno, but that corridor was developing uh, tremendously at this time. And then Nye County's growth can be almost entirely accounted for by Pahrump, which is an exurb of Las Vegas. So Elko County has uh, an accelerated growth, but it's the only one that isn't about being near something else that's also growing. That one is the one that we would attribute to mining, um, but it's not even. Again, you see down here, uh, uh, Eureka County is growing barely at all. Um, okay. Uh, so within just a few years after we've got, you know, the Mosey, right? And then in 1985, uh, Newmont opens Gold Quarry. Um, the, and that ex accelerates this, uh, this exploration and increases Newmont's uh, employee count, right? So as of 1985, about there on the map, uh, you would, uh, you would, Newmont had, um, I think, by itself over 500 employees uh, in Nevada. Mm -hmm. And then within just a few more years, um, driven by this fight against corporate takeover and Barrick's arrival on the Carlin trend, uh, massive ex expansion of the workforce. Newmont reported nearly 2,500 employees in 1989. Uh, so just here, from 500 to 2,500 employees, uh, not counting exploration staff nor construction personnel working for subcontractors. So it's probably even more. Elko's population surged, and Newmont sunk almost $30 million into building homes and apartments in Elko, plus more in donations to assist Elko schools. While most Carlin Trend miners lived in or near Elko, the town didn't benefit to the degree that you might expect from mining royalties. This is because of that county line jurisdiction thing. While Elko and the town of Carlin are in Elko County, the Carlin mine and most of the Carlin Trend are actually in Eureka County. Um, and therefore, uh, Eureka County benefited the most from the local property taxes uh, paid by the companies operating on the Trend. The wages, of course, go back to Elko, but the, the taxes, uh, the mining taxes go to the, the county, or at least part of them does. Um, okay, so let's look at the gold mines by county. This, I think, is quite interesting. This starts a little bit later. It starts in 1987, so sort of at the moment where the, the Mosey turns really into the rush. And you can see uh, the thick blue line, I should say, is Elko County. The thick red line is Eureka County. Um, and you can also see startup, uh, periods of startup in other counties. These are the other Nevada mines, the Carlin-type mines. Uh, we've got Humboldt County here in the yellow. Uh, we've got uh, White Pine County 
uh, here in the, the light blue, uh, Lander County in the green, a little less uh, substantial there. Um, so mining jobs, of course, do fluctuate with the state of the carbon trend production, uh, which itself has much to do with the price of gold on, on international uh, markets. But the boom that start, started in the mid 80s peaked in the mid 90s. Uh, the total mining employees statewide in the mid 90s was 14,700, which is a lot on one hand, and it's not all that much uh, on the other hand. You know, it, kind of a, a, an interesting thing. And if we think about this pattern of the number of major mines, you know, you can tell that it's somewhat mature, right? This is a pattern that suggests that, that we're not in the phase where a bunch of new mines are being constantly discovered, uh, at least in Elko and Eureka counties, right? That stuff is happening uh, in, in other places. This is a, a relatively mature from four to six, uh, you know, maybe down to as few as three uh, in Elko County, um, you know, three to four to three to eventually to two to three, right? It's all kind of lumped together in the, in the same thing in Eureka. This tells us that if you can account for that curve of production, you have to do it by not talking about new mines coming online. It's really more perhaps uh, about either succession, a mine goes offline and a new mine comes online, uh, or about expansion within existing properties. Yeah. Um, okay. And so then if we, uh, if we look to this then, the gold production by county, and I'll say more about this in a moment. I'll let you feast your eyes on this and, and finish up my thoughts on those employees there. Uh, because I moved my slide too early. Um, but uh, if, if we're looking at that mid-90s period, right, mid-90s peaks the, the number of jobs, about 14,700 total uh, statewide. Uh, it drops as the price of gold plummets in the early uh, 2000s, then it rebounded as the industry recovered. Um, as of about 2014, uh, Newmont and Barrick together had about 7,500 employees across the state, uh, with a majority of those located in Elko. Uh, companies report, reported hiring both in-state residents, something like 75% of new employees, according to Barrick, um, and also looking for talent out of state, uh, with, uh, though generally from other Western states. This is according to newspapers uh, from the time. Salaries in, those, in these mines, these are non-union mines, uh, they're high. Uh, general, uh, 2014 average figure I found in a newspaper said about $80,000 annually, so good work uh, if you can get it. Uh, so now if we take a look at the gold production, uh, this is again broken out by county. And I say adjusted briefly because if any of you wanted to retrace my steps and go to the, uh, find the particular file on the uh, Nevada uh, uh, Division of Mines uh, ArcGIS site that contains this information, they misfiled Carlin, like the Carlin operations itself. They have their, uh, it's geo, it's it, the lat longs are wrong um, and they put it in Elko County. Uh, which changes things pretty dramatically, as you can imagine. The reports put it correctly in Eureka County, but I had to figure that out and then uh, adjust accordingly. So here, the thick blue is Elko County down here, and the, the thick yellow line, this is Eureka County. And so I think that we could really kind of think of this as epitomizing the heart of the Carlin trend itself. Uh, I mean, you look at that production, right? Like a couple of peaks that are, you know, probably 3.8 million ounces per year, um, just from Eureka County, uh, I mean, holy Toledo. <laughs> and then also we have some interesting ones over here sort of buried in the noise. You've got, for example, Lander County uh, picks off, uh, takes off tremendously from the mid 2000s um, and eventually becomes almost as important as Eureka County uh, in the more recent history of, of gold mining in that area. Um, okay, so uh, so let's perhaps, uh, I guess the, the point I'm trying to make with the, with the production data is to suggest that the individual county jurisdictions do matter uh, in the face of other population trends. Um, and uh, again, remember at this time period, um, a significant tax revenue goes to the county government where the, the mine is located. I should mention that I drove through uh, Eureka once with my wife and she said, why is, why is this little tiny town, this is Eureka, the county seat down in the southern part of Eureka County, why is this little tiny town so spiffy? Um, and uh, as we're driving past the football field, which play, they play eight-man football at Eureka High School, they have uh, an artificial turf field um, because they've got loads of mining money and they don't know what to do with it. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, anyway, so uh, with that in mind, let's go and take a look at the population a little bit more closely. Okay, so this is the slide we saw before, the, the uh, rural county population. Uh, comparing the demographics of the Carlin trend to earlier rushes, has to be done cautiously, obviously. Uh, size, type, location, and the timing of the mine uh, all shape the workforce that labored in it. 
Um, you know, partly we've got much better statistics uh, than, uh, for example, Ron Limbaugh had to deal with with the census. You know, uh, you think about Virginia City, you think about Tonopah and Goldfield, and both of those big booms in Nevada his mining history occurred between censuses. Um, you know, they didn't capture the very height of it. But we've got here population estimates on a year by year basis, and that's what I'm using here. So uh, we might as well take advantage of, of those measures when, when we have them available to us. Um, so even so, uh, my point here is to raise a few points and, and maybe spur some thoughts for, for future investigation. Um, one thing is poverty level. Um, mining tends to bring economic activity that can create prosperity. Uh, the thick orange line here is Elko County and the thick blue line is Eureka. Uh, the dashed blue line that you see sort of here is the United States as a whole. And then the dashed red line uh, is Nevada as a whole. Um, as this table suggests, Elko County's percentage of the population living below the poverty line was lower than typical for Nevada pretty much throughout the boom period, uh, despite having been similar to other counties in 1959, which is where we start uh, over here. So again, uh, Elko County being the thick orange line. So it was a little bit above the Nevada average, but not by a lot, and it was grouped pretty tightly with the other counties. Um, an interesting contrast is Eureka County. Um, it benefits substantially from these taxes, but this is a much rougher ride when it comes to poverty level. Like, I wonder what in the early 80s is causing, you know, uh, 25 or more percent poverty level in a, in the, my, in a county that receives uh, that kind of revenue. Uh, pretty interesting stuff, right? So Elko, perhaps because of the jobs, a little bit higher poverty level than the state of Nevada until about the late 1980s when the boom really takes off. And then after that, that huge takeoff, it's a little bit better than the state as a whole, uh, reaching its peak uh, in terms of low, uh, low poverty level where the state uh, was shooting upward. Uh, in Here it's in 2010, but you can tell that that's the result of the, the Great Recession of 2009. Um, okay, so uh, second slide. Let's talk about, uh, oops, there we go. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the racial makeup of, of Elko County. Uh, like Nevada, like the West as a whole, has become less white over time. This is not a surprise. Um, however, the data suggests here that Elko County is still substantially white. Um, so these are selected counties. Uh, again, Elko in the thick red. Uh, you've got Eureka County in the thick, uh, the thick uh, yellow uh, there. Um, and in this one, I left Clark County in it. Uh, because Clark, as Clark County, uh, home of Las Vegas goes, pretty much goes the statistics for the state of Nevada. Um, and uh, I wanted you to be able to see the substantial non-whitening of Nevada's population as a whole, uh, which is really about Clark County. Um, and, uh, and putting that in perspective with the rural counties is pretty interesting. So in particular, as in the decade as that boom accelerates, um, you know, we've got uh, Elko County coming, be becoming ever so slightly more white between 1980 and 1990. That's a very slight positive inclination in these numbers. And then it's become slightly less white uh, since then. Um, so we might safely infer that these, these new jobs during the boom were attracted to white workers. This is, again, if you lived there, probably not a surprise. Um, but this is the kind of thing that historians need to document. Um, and so then uh, another question that we might ask uh, about a modern gold rush is whether or not there was actually a boom bust cycle happening on the ground. I mean, you think about it this way, if we date the Carlin trend to 1965, then, you know, the Carlin trend just off the top of my head is 56 years old, right? I mean, it, it, it's close to retirement. It, it, the Carlin trend uh, is genuinely historic or potentially historic from the standpoint of the Section 106, the National Register of Historic Places, which puts a 50-year time limit on it. So, I mean, this has been around a while, and we might wonder, like, is there boom and bust? Um, so, uh, so there might be. Right, the figures. I, I wanted to to see if we could figure out a little something about the population. Uh, who is going to be there? Who's who's coming there? Um, and so these figures are unfortunately this was the the worst data that I encountered in trying to to compile it. Graphing this out uh, was was ugly. So I figured I'd just give you the table in this case. I hope you'll forgive me. This is the only table uh, in the talk. Um, but uh, these are are figures for the percent of the population that was born in the U.S. They're not always available or reliable, but Maybe they'll be revealing is my hope, bearing in mind what else we, we know about mining history in other places. Um, here, Elko County sees an increase in foreign-born residents between 1980 and 2000, certainly during the, the period of, uh, of that boom. 
um, though not as large of an increase as in the largest urban metro counties, uh, Washoe and, and Clark. Here's Clark, as you can see, uh, drops by more than 10 percent um, or, uh, yeah, decreases by, by more than 10 percent. Um, but even so, Elko still had a smaller proportion of foreign-born residents in 2000 uh, than it did in 1960 uh, before the, the boom happened, right? So, so again, it got sort of more native-born uh, over time, Elko County did. Uh, which I think is, is rather interesting and bears, uh, we'll come back to that, that statistic. Okay, uh, so that's not super helpful. I wish it were, were better, but for the later years of the boom, we can also discuss migration from the other parts of the United States, both inside and out. Um, this data goes back to 1991, so the boom is well underway uh, at, at this period. Let me start with this slide. This shows all Nevada counties and Nevada as a whole. Nevada is the blue line here, and then Clark County, where Las Vegas is, is the yellow line. Um, and I wanted to, to just put this in here uh, super briefly, uh, because you can see that there was a huge influx into the state, first of all, uh, fastest growing state in the union for a, a number of these years, but that was really being driven by Clark County. That was, uh, that was Las Vegas. Um, so in this graph, the rural counties, such as Elko, where mining is taking place, are these ones down here, and they, they barely register a blip. You know, and of course, inflow migration goes uh, plummets uh, for during the Great Recession than has rebounded since then. So I wanted to give you a sense of the broader state context. This is a good example of one of the reasons why, you know, people who are from Elko charge that Las Vegas has no idea about mining, and they're not wrong, but Vegas has its own kind of things going on. Um, okay, so if we take out uh, the state totals, uh, take out Clark County, um, we get some interesting patterns. So Elko is the thick yellow line here. Um, and Eureka County is the thick orange line, which you can barely see. Um, and uh, look at this, right? So big influx, and then a very sharp period of outgo. And this is year-by-year -year data. Uh, influx, outgo. Up, influx, outgo. Um, the zero line, you know, the way that this data is structured is that if it's a net outward migration, it's a minus. And if it's a net inward migration to the county, it's a plus. And so you can really see far more so, I think, in terms of its downs as well as its ups, that Elko County experienced a, a population ride in terms of domestic migration uh, that no other county in Nevada did. Um, these ones up here, um, I think, are, uh, are Lion and Nye, again, associated with the sort of ec the growth of the exurbs uh, around Las Vegas and, and, uh, and the Reno area. Um, and then Eureka, as our kind of control, is buried right here around zero. Um, it's, it traces, it's hard to see because even though I made it thick, uh, you know, it's just a little bit up and a little bit down. Of course, Eureka County is a very tiny place, so the movements aren't going to be huge, but, uh, but Eureka County seems to be in a stasis despite all the mining activity, despite the mining taxes, in a way that Elko County, which doesn't necessarily have as much of the mining taxes, but has very much the mining population, Elko County, because of the population, is the one that rides uh, these boom bust cycle trends. Okay, so then uh, how might we place this information in historical perspective? The first point is that there's clearly a population rush to go along with the production of minerals, and those people periodically leave town. I think, I think we've demonstrated that. Uh, this might be an obvious thing to anyone who's lived there while this was happening, but this is important to capture on paper. Uh, next, compared with earlier gold, silver, and copper rushes, the Carlin trend draws a remarkable number of native-born white Americans to its workforce. This extensive, the extensive immigrant labor common in earlier eras, such as the Cornish in Grass Valley, the Irish on the Comstock, uh, or the Eastern Europeans in Ely and other porphyry copper deposits, has been largely absent on the, the Carlin trend, at least according to this data. A simple, though perhaps incomplete explanation is there's simply not anything like the number of unskilled jobs on the Carlin trend as there were in the more labor-intensive minds of earlier generation. Women also work on the Carlin trend, uh, though not in numbers proportionate to the population, which is a distinct difference from, uh, from earlier mining booms. Second, the Carlin, trend, uh, Carlin mines pay quite well, uh, which is a contrast to some historic mining, such as the porphyry coppers, but it's consistent with the history of mining in other areas, such as the well-paid miners of the Comstock load. We can speculate that some of the high pay can be attributed to a desire for a stable workforce, which is not easy to achieve in rural areas. Uh, and note that the Carlin trends are, mines are not unionized, although I think the operating engineers uh, had a, a running the mills uh, for one of the companies, it might have been Newmont, were unionized for a couple of decades, but then I think eventually the employees decertified that union. Um, but this is not what you'd call union labor, right? This isn't Butte. Um, 
Third, the substantial commuting distances of Carlin miners offers a potentially interesting point for further comparison. 19th century miners walked to work, necessitating dense towns near the mines like Grass Valley, Nevada City, Virginia City, and others. Uh, late 19th and early 20th century mining districts, uh, such as Butte or Ely, had trolleys for those who lived further from the mines. Even 20th century mining populations developed entirely in the age of the automobile, such as the mining town of Kearney, Arizona, uh, were still located within a relatively short commute of the mine. Uh, by contrast, Newmont and other operators on the Carlin trend seem to have never made any real attempt to house workers near the mines and instead have encouraged development in Elko, 40 plus miles from the work site. In these ways, the Carlin trend seems to most closely resemble the modern era lignite coal mines of the Powder River Basin as described in Jessica Smith's excellent ethnography, Mining Coal and Undermining Gender. Uh, those are, of course, are the comparisons I've just made to you. I forgot to, this is the disadvantage of advancing your own slides. Um, anyway, I think that this most closely resembles those Wyoming Powder River Basin coal mines. Uh, for Smith, and I should mention, of course, you see here that it's Jessica Smith Rolston. She's, she goes by her, uh, her maiden name for her academic work now. Um, her eth excellent uh, ethnography um, shows Wyoming's workforce is largely white. It's entirely non-union, it's gender diverse, and it's largely drawn from the surrounding uh, area. The Wyoming miners endure long commutes from homes in regional rural hub towns and shift work schedules to make substantial paychecks by laboring in surface mines. And like the Carlin trend, mass production mining in the Powder River Basin is tremendously productive on a tonnage per employee basis. Smith's work suggests the potential fruitfulness of cross-sector comparisons in analyzing modern era mining. Um, so the Carlin trend is, uh, by any accounting, a, tremendous, a tremendously important site for studying the recent history of resource extraction in the United States. The original Carlin mine itself ceased production in 1986, having generated 3.2 million ounces of gold in 21 years. Today, the Nevada and its Car today Nevada and its Carlin trend mines continue to produce gold in quantities unfathomable to earlier generations of miners. Let me lay some of these statistics on you. These are the ones that, that made my eyes pop. Uh, of all the gold ever produced in Nevada, uh, remember that the Comstock load was gold and silver, um, including the Comstock load, 89% of the total gold ever produced in Nevada has been produced since 1965. And 87% of that total since the Carlin trend boom started to accelerate, since the Mosey became a boom in 1981. This production dwarfs previous gold rushes. The California gold rush produced somewhere between 29 to 70 million ounces of gold, uh, and the Comstock perhaps 34 million ounces. By contrast, through 2019, the cumulative production from Carlin-type Nevada mines was 92.5 million ounces of gold, or something like 1.5% of all gold ever mined on this planet in the course of human history. Scale, right? Uh, despite its importance, there have been only limited attempts to understand the region's mining history. Beginning in the early 1990s, some efforts were made to record some of the early exploration history. Um, some oral history has been conducted with some of the major figures. Uh, more need to be done, but there are at least a few. Uh, a recent Corporate Insider History of Newmont is helpful if celebratory. That's uh, Jack Morris. Uh, Dean Height, of course, recently published a, a, a comprehensive history of the mining activity in the area surrounding the Carlin mine, uh, but he consciously halted his account just before the modern moment of discovery. Uh, Dick Reed, Curtis Johnson, and Michael Russell have worked up a recent paper for the Geological Society of Nevada that sketches out some of this terrain. There's also some occasional gray literature reports that describe history and archaeology of mine mined areas, and some of the best of those have been turned with company support into historical monographs. And here I'm thinking of Obermeyer and McQueen, uh, particularly. Um, but there's a lot to do. You know, uh, there are also some significant changes underway that will likely open a new chapter of this history. In 2019, the two heavyweights, Newmont and Barrick. After decades of battling each other in the stock markets and the boardrooms, finally merged their Nevada mining operations to form a new venture, new joint venture called, uh, appropriately enough, Nevada Gold Mines. Uh, very, very creative. Um, the new firm controls 12 open pit mines, 10, <clears throat> 10 underground mines, five enormous heat bleaching facilities, four oxide mills, two autoclaves, two roasters, and a flotation mill, plus like a power plant. Um, Barrick ended up with control in a practical sense. Uh, they own 61.5% uh, of the ownership and they are the operating uh, responsibility. Um, the new firm now also enjoys single operator dominance, which appears to already be reshaping the, the social relations of the Carlin Rush. The combined workforce seems to be shrinking, especially among the ranks of professionals and contractors. Nevadans wonder if the new firm in absence of a competitor will be a supportive partner in the social and cultural arenas. 
these questions are far too fresh to answer or to answer definitively. Um, and the impacts of the COVID-19 epidemic along with the statewide positive PR campaign in the face of a proposal to dramatically increase uh, mining taxes, a proposal which ultimately did not uh, happen in the form that they imagined, uh, all that would distort any real-time analysis. And plus we're historians, we, we're, we're no good at, at doing present day history. But even so, consolidation is often an important turning point in the life of a district. And this one bears careful monitoring. The potential for further historical research seems clear. We have a large field of questions that we collectively have just at best started to answer. What's the social history of the boom? How do we categorize the labor history of Carlin type mining? What about the history of the use of science and new technologies? What is the material culture of this rush? And what bits of material culture should be saved and interpreted for the future? How has the geography of modern mining changed and how does that shape the character of the boom and the fates of individual places such as the town of Elko or Eureka County? Uh, I think the Carlin trend offers important opportunities to consider the structure, the labor costs and the benefits of modern day mining. It's chronological contemporaneousness, I hope that's a word, uh, the vast environmental scale of its processes and its location in the United States instead of a country safely elsewhere and out of mind could all have the potential to enrich a real debate about the impacts, positive and negative, of mining in the American West and its relationship to our modern consumer society. And so let me encourage you all, let me end this way, let me encourage you all in my capacity as now the president of the Mining History Association and in your capacity as mining historians and enthusiasts to adjust the scale, zoom out a little bit and ponder these big questions posed to us by this modern gold boom. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great job, President Nystrom, great job. That sounded like Chris, thank you, Chris. Um, I'd be happy to answer some questions. Uh, this is, a, again, um, you know, there are lots of people who know more about the particulars than I do. And, and my hope here was to, to bring some of that, uh, that historical perspective here. So I'm happy to answer questions. And, and if I can't answer your question, my guess is that we've got at least a couple of people in the audience who can. Wow. Eric? Before we get started, can I just, we, we've got a, a, a little technical thing. At the sure. top of the hour, we start a different session. So I'll need about five minutes to close this one down and open the next. So you've got. Yeah, we've got, uh, got 10, 15 minutes. 10, 15 minutes. No problem. Eric, okay. <laughs> Eric, Mark Langenfeld. Go ahead, Mark. Um, just, just a question. If, if Maybe if you could go back to your slide that talks about the domestic population changes in the, in the various counties. Yes, indeed. Uh, let me fire go back. Yeah, we really don't have to go back to it, but you've got it framed in terms of bodies. And I think, uh, as you noted, as you correctly noted, um, Eureka County got lost in the noise simply because it's a small county. No, actually, uh, it's the one that's titled domestic, domestic. Oh, the migration. Yes. Yeah, the migration. I think it would be really instructive if you were to redo that chart in terms of percentage change for each county, uh, I think the detail that's lost in Eureka County would then maybe jump out a little bit more profoundly. You'd be comparing apples to apples um, while ignoring the, the disparities in um, population in each individual county. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that, Mark. And, and you know, if we had a little bit more time, uh, I would. Uh, if this were the standard talk, I would have printed out my tables and I'd bring them to you and, and we could uh, pour over these my, uh, ourselves. Uh, I have all this data um, and I think that's an excellent uh, choice. My sense is from sort of glancing over the data itself uh, that it, it wasn't a lot of change in Eureka County, um, which is weird. I mean, Eureka got like they got a, a big pit right on the edge of town. You know, so I mean, there would be some like it's right on the edge of, of the town of Eureka. It's the Archimedes pit there. Um, so there would be a little bit, um, but uh, but in a general sense, I was surprised by how little there was, given the extensiveness of, of mining in, in the county, the, the extensiveness of the mining operations uh, in the county of Eureka. Thanks, Eric. I, I really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Mark. Hey, Eric. So, yep. um, you know, a couple things. One is, yes, Archimedes was on the edge of town, but all right, we didn't. You know, it wasn't all that big. You know, so the, the number of people coming and going <laughs> wouldn't have been that huge. Show no, show no. I did make a comment that um, Newmont's mines were union, but only on the Carlin trend. Okay. 
I do. Okay. I'm not quite sure what happened after they got into NGM. It's been a kerfuffle. <laughs> Yeah, I know there's been a, 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 I declined to talk about it, but I've been following it in the news. There was a little, uh, yeah, kerfuffle is a good word for it about, <laughs> uh, about NGM uh, essentially decertifying the union without uh, following proper procedures, which um, is, uh, puts you in the naughty list. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one other thing about the demographics too, is that, you know, when you look at the older stuff, people coming in and out, um, you know, by the 1980s, and when people came to Nevada, a lot of them were already skilled laborers. So a lot of the people that would have come in prior to the 60s were moving from Nevada, Wyoming, some of those other mining heavy places. Yeah, uh, there are some really intriguing questions about that. Um, I uh, talked about Carlin for the first time in public at a Western History Association meeting. And because we had the great fortune uh, of having uh, Katie Benton Cohen uh, from Georgetown, a uh, professor at Georgetown, uh, on the panel, uh, there were some Bisbee people in the audience, and uh, and one of them said that uh, that there were a bunch of Bisbee folks. Bisbee wound down in the late seventies. I think the pit there closed, and I want to say seventy five ish, and operations kind of concluded by the end of the seventies. Um, and this Bisbee person reported that there were a bunch of folks who created kind of a chain of migration up to Elko and worked in the mines for you know a decade or two, uh, which would have made sense, right? It was open pit, hard rock mining you know, not coal. Um, and so, so those kinds of connections, I think, are there. Um, but it's the kind of thing that this kind of data can't, can't tell us. Yeah, I know when uh, we went underground, there were two groups of people. One were the Arizona men, and the other were the uh, North Idaho guys that all came when we went underground. Um, huge influx. Wow. See, that's fascinating. And that's enough, the kind of thing that... A lot you know, of them in, didn't actually move to Elko. They commuted. Wow. I mean... Yeah, these commutes get get crazy, right? And if you follow the literature, uh, you know, the mining press, you know, you can see references to FIFO, um, which, of course, is an old computer guy. I figured it means first in, first out. No, it's fly in, fly out. There are mines in like Australia, for example, where there is no mining town. The mining town is is a flight away from uh, on from your everyday work. And, and they do that uh, for a whole variety of reasons. And so these kinds of extreme commutes these sorts of migration patterns, you know, this is the sort of stuff that I guess that I'm getting at, that we know some of this stuff for other places in mining history. Um, and now's our chance to save it for Elko, right? Now's the time to, to get this stuff down. I mean, I think I know some of this. I've got a few little tidbits, you know, far more. And, and anyone who's had an association with this, like, I'm hoping that you'll think in historical perspective, write some stuff down, right? Um, and future historians will say, thank you. <laughs> we will. Yeah, and like I said, I know that for our 50th anniversary at Newmont, there were a bunch of oral histories done, and I probably should find out where those ended up. I would love to get an email about where those are. Both uh, uh, miners, people from Elko, suppliers, um, people like uh, Lou Ackland, who was one of the first drillers, um, you know, things like that. And I know they're out there, I'm just not quite sure where they're at. Excellent. Yeah. In addition to Lee's great work, there's a, a volume of uh, oral history of Nevada mining uh, published by the University of Nevada Oral History Project. But other than that, I mean, I don't know about them. Uh, I hope they exist and, and uh, hopefully they can be treasured as the sources that they are. And one of the troubles is that, you know, contemporary history is so contemporary that a lot of times we don't think of it as especially historical. So, uh, you know, part of my goal here is to kind of highlight that we really are living uh, through a moment uh, that's that's tremendous and and you know and hopefully to kind of stoke the fires a little bit to to save and interpret this history um who else has uh, got questions i see some hands uh it looks like uh john kurth and and mike Kaz and, and pete maculitis uh john go ahead so um i don't i don't want to jump ahead too quickly and i and i said you you, you might have said you hinted at some of this but uh, some of the recent history uh has been the boom and bust cycles in uh resource, western resource towns and, you know, we're, you know, I'm thinking maybe the uh, copper mines in the 70s uh, and 80s, uh, uranium in the 1980s. And, uh, you know, I think Powder River coal production has peaked and uh, is, uh, you know, they're still mining coal there, but it's not anything like the production was in the past. Uh, are, are we uh, looking at, uh, uh, you know, uh, another situation where we're, where we're seeing just a continuation of the western boom bust cycle like that's that's it's just a thought 
question. It's not a, it's not an accusation. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that that's a good question to raise. And I'll just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to your comment by simply saying that this is a good example of where historians can be of, of genuine value to the public. Um, it could be helpful, for example, for people in Elko to understand uh, in historical perspective what modern mining resource town boom bust cycles looks like. You know, my guess is that they've got a sense of it. I mean, you know, they're, they're petrified that the jobs will go away. They know that. Like it, people are, we've got very smart people and they're not dumb by any means. But I do wonder if there might be historical connections or historical trends that we can see illustrated in some of these places that could be of use to essentially like local level, local and state level policymakers. Um, you know, it, I would imagine that, that there's probably something. Uh, I don't have those answers, but um, it's inspirational to think that, that we might collectively be able to do some good along those lines. Um, I think uh, Mike uh, and then uh, then Peter Mack. Go ahead, Mike. I've got a, a another uh, web web uh, illustration problem. Would you please hold up the pick plaque so that we can get a screenshot of you? Sure. You, you did it briefly, but you were in very very small. Uh, I move fast. That's okay. really the issue. And, there we and, go. And just back up a little. Uh, I got to get. Uh, I got to kind of clear comments. Okay, Too that far. sounds good. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Hey, whose name's right at the top there? Uh, Clem, was that you? No, it was Nordberg here. Oh, I see. This um, is, this the other Eric. Right? Then we'll go on. Uh, uh, Peter Maculaeus, you got a question? Uh, not a question, a comment. Uh, I'll be quick because I know you got to get on to the next session. <clears throat> when Dick Reed and I were first talking about bringing a conference to Elko, one of the things that I was hoping for, and I'm, I'm glad I see Eleanor back there, was collecting the history of the people that were involved in Boom, particularly the ones in the late 70s and early 80s. I mean, there's several people around. Tom Cool came with Homestake. Uh, the, you know, Pete Chapman with Pancana, Cornsey out of Canada and Merker, you know, people came from everywhere. They were, and there were refugees from the uranium bust cycle that came, Charlie Selfrian. So I hope that somewhere in the future, someone gets together and collects those histories of those people. I mean, John Hogg, an Englishman, Keith Bettles is, is Australian. You know, it really was an interesting collecting pot you know, and as far as commutes, uh, Paul Hoba, who came out of that uranium bust cycle and worked for Western states, he's now commuting bec between his home in Florida and the Pogo mine in Alaska. So that will show you what commutes are like. Uh, I'll, I'm, I'll be gone now. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. I mean, you know, one of the challenges for this kind of thing is that, you know, like you just rattled off of, off the top of your head a dozen names, I think, or half a dozen anyway. Um, and, uh, you know, all of us have a finite time on this rock. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the challenges of oral history projects starts with finding people. Um, it also starts with having people to, who get, you know, have the, the time and dedication, the money uh, to, to do this kind of work, you know. And so there are a lot of folks, I think, who might be, who might have a generalized, you know, like a, a full heart, uh, you know, about this history. You know, but part of the challenge is that, that at some level, I think that we need to think seriously about how do we convert a full heart into action, um, you know, and that's probably a local thing, at least partly, um, but partly, you know, what can we do to support that? And so I don't know if, Peter, if you're going to, you know, be interviewing anybody, but if you could at least put together a list of names, that's a place to start, right? And then, you know, maybe some folks who are there and some folks who are elsewhere, you know, can we uh, you know, can you put together a team? You can start thinking about things. Can we start asking people for money? I don't know, but like this stuff doesn't, you know, the wishing part doesn't make it work. And that's the, mm. I think the well, thing my, my that comment, is, is so challenging about this. Can I, can I respond? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay. This reminds me of being in Franco. One time the chairman of the board said, Peter, you come up with great questions. One day you'll learn how to answer one of them. And I said, that's not my job. He, he didn't come back on that one. But the thing is that I can put together a list, you know, of people. Uh, you know, that's a good beginning. I know that I'm not going to be the person that does the heavy lifting. Yeah. That's, that's not part of my DNA. <laughs> 
Well, but, you know, you think about what do we know about the gold rush, right? What do we know about the Comstock? And so many of those things, you know, some of it is people like Hubert Howe Bancroft, uh, who in the 1880s set out to, to actually find an interview. They brought along scribes and transcribed interviews uh, with people. This is before tape recording, um, who were there. Uh, but a lot of it is that so-and-so had a diary. So-and-so's got some old papers. Eh, rather than throw it out, how about we give it to somebody? You know, and then you got somebody, maybe that's a museum, maybe that's a cultural institution, maybe that's a whatever, who can say, sure, we'll take that. Right. I mean, so there are a bunch of different layers at which this stuff operates. You know, if you've got old papers kicking around, just think twice before throwing them out, you know, and then others of us can work on like, can we, you know, how, like I know Dean's working with the museum there in, in Elko, like how much stuff will they take? Um, how can we make sure that that stuff gets well protected? Things like that. Right. I mean, these are big sort of bigger questions, but all of that goes into saving the history of something as especially as big and long term, vast scale. Right. Uh, as the as the, the Carlin lines. Uh, Lisa, you've got your hand up. Go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I was just going to comment that um, we're in the process of developing a, an oral history project with next to no budget. Um, so the Bancroft Library actually has a website, a web page devoted to kind of um, do-it-yourself oral histories. So without the recording equipment, without the cameras, without everything, because they did a lot of that during COVID. So for people who are interested in that, that's a great place to start because they have a lot of resources on how to create a Zoom-based oral history project, which we're trying to do. So That's great. Lisa, who is we? Uh, oh, sorry. Um, uh, Colorado School of Mines. Uh, I'm, I'm with the, I, I manage our mining history archive and our school history archive. And right now we're focused on uh, a, an oral history for the women of mines. Um, but I hope to get some oral histories in some of the other collections, including the mining history collection as well. Um, a bigger issue for us is what to do with them once we have them. But um, it's a lot easier. The more people have had to use Zoom, the easier it gets to be able to at least record them. So, Right. And as part of a university, you've got, uh, you know, you've got some assets for digital management, for example, um, that, uh, say, a small museum in northern Nevada probably doesn't have. You know? And so those are the kinds of ways in which um, you know, different kinds of institutions. Institutions have scales too, right? Um, you know, operating at, at different times and places can really make uh, important contributions. It's not all, you don't have to be a local to make it work. Um, you don't have to not be a local to make it work. They can just yeah, do different kinds of things. There are also consortia out there that if you can hook up with one of the, the bigger players as a group effort, like the Denver Public Library supports the Colorado Railroad Museum's digitization efforts and gets it into a national repository. So there's there's ways to kind of get around the fact that that you lack a, a stable platform. Um, you know, we've we've had to work with that for years. So yeah. Yeah. Okay, we that. need to to close down this session. 